Uh, hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to the channel. This is Carmina, astrologer and reader with the Cards of Truth. And today we have a very interesting guest with us. Welcome Matt Rice. Hi. Uh, and Matt is a practitioner of the human design system and he's also uh, a tarot practitioner and he integrates uh, several um, I don't know, several methods in doing his reading, several approaches. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your approach and how you got into human design? Um, well, it's kind of a long story. I, I was uh, really interested in Kabbalah and tarot when I was 16. And that's when I started wanting to understand that system as much as I could. And, and also the combination with astrology. And so studying all those together it has been always been really important to me. That's kind of what my website is based on, uh, terotica.net. Mm -hmm. And studying Kabbalah in combination with numerology and astrology and tarot and kind of seeing how the symbolism works in between all of those um, has really helped create a, a foundation. But then like in... Um, 2010 somebody gave me a gene keys reading i've never heard of gene keys i hadn't even heard of human design yet mm -hmm. and <clears throat> i had no idea where it came from or what it was i didn't i, I made sure not to uh, pry too deeply because it seemed like it, it was something that had to come in its own time and in its own way and that's a typical thing i think that happens with both the gene keys and human design uh it kind of needs to come to the person in the right way because uh, I think when people are confronted with it and it's not the right time it just seems like a weird a strange dinky little thing with lines all over it's like I'm not ready for another new age claptrap <laughs> thank you uh, but when it when it comes to you and it speaks to you and you're in just the right place to receive it that's kind of where I was I mean I, I went over my gene keys over about three months and then that it started to unlock some things for me, uh, which is typical with the gene keys. Uh, Can you, you tell us it. a little what are the gene keys? Because I don't really know what the gene Okay. Uh, Richard Rudd, he wrote the gene keys book. And uh, he uh, started traveling the world back in, I, I forgot, I've listened to his story once. I don't know exact dates, but um, he could have taken over his family or not, maybe not taken over, but uh, inherited a, a large portion of his family's uh, wine business. He decided not to do that and to travel instead the world and learn as much as he could about spirituality and things like that. And he, he was having very spiritual experiences for a good part of his life. And then this was another big thing, uh, being able to travel the world and study and learn as much as he could. And he started to get really into the I Ching and he had another profound, maybe one or two profound spiritual experiences where time came to an end. Uh, there was no such thing as time. He went to a completely formless state of mind and got quite a download of timeless, boundless information. And after this, I think it was like a few months or maybe a year after this or something, he found human design. And to him, human design was the missing link in, in all these experiences that he'd, he'd been having. And he was already really into um, the I Ching. So when he found human design, it was like, okay, it, was, it completed. A, and then he ended up spent like pour, pouring all the rest of what, what money he had into uh, learning as much as he possibly could about human design uh, with Ra, taking all the classes as much as he could. Uh, and the gene keys are basically a treatment of each hexagram, mm -hmm. each hexagram. Uh, and it's, it's a really fascinating way to get into human design or a, a kind of a, uh, an accompanying system because some people will say Gene Keys doesn't have really that much to do with human design and they shouldn't be too closely used together but I use them together quite often because mm -hmm. there's sort of there's sort of a divide that happened with human design which we might be able to get into at one point but mm -hmm. um, it's basically looking at your sun earth placements first and foremost with human design. Uh, you look at the sun and the earth on the personality side with your body graph and then the sun and the earth on the design side with your body graph. And 
it's that that really fascinated me. That that was a really powerful place for me to come into all of this because I had just been writing about it on my website with decanate crosses and understanding the decanate crosses, like if you have a cross of sixes and how that corresponds to corresponds to the sixes in tarot, uh, the sixth uh, the sixth sphere on the tree of life, and all of that, like and all these decanates, how they correspond to, you know, different things. And I was already looking at crosses and wrote a lot about it and uh, was writing about uh, the cross in terms of astrology, like um, on my cross of the elements page and reclaiming the cross and what that 90 degree angle is really about. You know, in astrology, we call them squares. Yes. Uh, they're, they're difficult, but they're difficult for a reason. It's, they can be difficult because it's like um, an evolutionary, yeah, it's, it's like alchemy. So you take what's heavy about it, the iron cross, and turn it into, into like a rose or a, that, that really interesting alchemical yes. process. <laughs> yes. Right, exactly. So, yeah, being, you know, kind of martyred upon the cross as we might feel and then spiritualizing it through a process to where you kind of like go through the story of Christ. You're, you're resurrected. It's no longer um, suffering. It's the fuel for an enlightened state while, while still being able to be on that cross, so to speak, uh, as to still, to still experience the world as an individual because the cross is also symbolic of, you know, North, South, East, and West. Mm -hmm. And who's in the middle of that always you are mm -hmm. right. So it's interesting, you get to still have your point of view, but you, it's no longer uh, like a pressure in, imploding feeling of lostness. It's more of a, a, a kind of a fountain of appreciation that can come out of it. Mm -hmm. And when I found the Gene Keys, I didn't know that that's what it was about yet, but I knew it was speaking to me. And I kind of went back and forth with it over three months. And then I found human design and made the connection. Oh, this is what the Gene Keys are largely coming out of and I started to have really powerful experiences with alignment and energy coming into me and, and understanding my own incarnation cross and lots of synchronicities kind of like that I mean I already work with synchronicities quite a bit it kind of guides my work in, in a large way so this was just another huge synchronicity and then I, I uh, I'm like oh oh well I'm, I'm gonna have to pour my whole life into this now because I'd already been working on other things and I kind of had to abandon certain parts of my website that I was working on that aren't finished yet. I can't bring myself to go back to them because I'm so busy with this uh, human design thing. So but, you're pretty much self-taught like with the human design thing. You didn't go to like the official classes and... Uh, I've taken... Well, I, I did a deep dive mm -hmm. with Gene Keys. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in 2011 or 2012. And that was cool. You know, a lot of Gene Keys teachers came together and um, uh, were, they would take you through certain modules, right? Of We're going to look at this and then focus on that uh, Gene Key and what it means. And then we'll focus on this the next week. And I think it was like four weeks long. And we would have private sessions, group sessions. And it was a really cool idea. They'd already done it three times, I think, mm -hmm. two, two or three times. And the third time was the last time, I think. So I was glad, glad I got to catch it. Um, so I have had um, one Gene Keys session, uh, one session, I mean, one uh, deep dive, and I haven't really ha I had a professional, quote unquote, human design reading because it's kind of a strange thing. I I've already, there's, so, there's a lot available online. There used to be more, actually. With yes, the I saw you deleted some of your videos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some, some of them. Yeah. There, there was a, an ABC course that was available and a cartography course that was available online for free. And it had so much information. This is before the different science of differentiation book came out. Um, and it was such a good resource to, to, if you wanted to be serious about learning the system to go from beginning to end, instead of just skipping ahead to your channel or your profile, mm -hmm. which is what people do in the beginning. They want to know about yeah. <laughs> their profile, their channel. And after doing that for a few months and maybe looking at your family and your friends, it's like, for me anyway, it was like, okay, time to go to the very beginning and slowly get through all of this. And I did. Um, 
and that taught me a lot. And I always shared those links, but over the past three years, uh, they got taken down. They're, they're dead links now. So it's kind of difficult uh, to find a, a real comprehensive uh, uh, course like that online. Uh, yes. You could get the Science uh -huh. of Differentiation book. Yeah, I noticed there are so many sources, but they're so repetitive, even word to word, like mm -hmm. same phrasing. It's like the same, you, you hear many people parroting the same thing. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a bit annoying. Yeah. That's why I yeah. like uh, looking at your YouTube channel because you have a more unique perspective and you seem to filter it in your own way. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, it shows that you spend a lot of time thinking about it, so. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I, my mind already kind of works like that. Like, I love, even before I started talking about human design, I was making videos looking at symbolism because I used to have mm -hmm. another channel before this YouTube channel. And I like did a, like an hour and a half video just looking at ba uh, uh, Babylon and the beast mm -hmm. or the whore of Babylon symbolism mm -hmm. where she's riding the seven headed beast and she's ho holding a grail and what that is about astrologically, the seven planets. And then you have this uh, uh, feminine consciousness, which you could call uh, corresponds to Bina on the tree of life, the, the no thing in particular, but that is the cradle for everything. Uh, the whore of Babylon, quote unquote. And talking about that for, with all these slides and everything, I ended up deleting that video too. Uh, <laughs> Because this was a long time ago when I was just trying to get confident in myself, like I know I can do it, uh, <laughs> but sometimes I'd be like, "Oh, I don't like it," and delete it. But uh, I, I eventually came into my confidence. But I've always loved being able to tell stories about symbolism. You know, I'd already been giving tarot readings for so long, mm -hmm. and when I found human design, it's like, "Whoa, now this is a, a real story," uh, and it's starting to connect it to so so many other things because it's a really powerful revelation that Ra received. And when I make correlations between human design and the state of the world and where this evolution is going, um, in human design lingo, it's moving from leftness into rightness, which is a fascinating thing all by itself. Uh, the different levels of that, you can think about it like left brain and right brain. Um, but we don't just have left brain, right brain, we have left being and right being. So you could say we're moving more into right being, which is, uh, more connected to the no thing in particular, right? Our leftness that we've been in for so, so long, like many thousands of years, um, that leftness is really concentrated. And you could say it, it has a lot of uh, security issues. It needs to, and this is where a lot of our ego complexes have come out of because we need to feel really secure and it's really linear too. Like in all our sense of time, we are very time-based beings you know it's all like dit, 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 with our calendars mm. and our watches and everything that's all quite left and it's so fascinating to me how Ra would talk about we're moving from leftness into rightness and how this is mapped out on the body graph and everything um yeah that's always that's been a huge preoccupation for me uh like not only talking about it but experiencing it myself and uh, moving into different states that seem to be in, in alignment with the ongoing revelation of it because I, I don't think it was just Ra. Mm -hmm. In his revelation, it, you know, Richard Rudd was having his revelations. And so many people are having revelations these days. It's like, that's why, you know, the revelations in the Bible, it's like, <laughs> we're, we're, in, we're in the time of revelations, right? Mm -hmm. um, or apocalypse, which basically means remove, removing of a covering, like a, it's a revealing, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's so many revelations and revealings that so many people are having that even don't even know anything about human design. Exactly. Uh, and I think, I think they're all valid. And I think there, there is something to be said for all the different ways uh, people are seeing. And like, uh, say, say, for example, with evolutionary astrology uh, that came to Jeff Green, um, that's a powerful form of astrology that I utilize in my, in my reading sometimes. And that's a valid, very valid revelation that took place that focuses on Pluto placements and the nodal placements and, and certain other configurations and seeing how this evolutionary astrology, it's fascinating because it kind of is in alignment with human design as well. Evolutionary astro astrology is about moving from unconscious evolution where we've been in for so long, like just, we're just kind of blindly evolving into something moving from unconscious evolution where we're, it's just kind of being pushed around by the forces into conscious evolution, 
where you do have a choice. You can align with your evolution. You can align with your North node. You can align with the polarity point of your Pluto consciously. And that will help you evolve rather than experiencing some kind of catastrophe, which is something that can happen quite often with Pluto if you're not aware of what's coming, what's happening. You're still yes, trying to Pluto hold on to It's such a powerful ego basher. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I'm experiencing. Uh, Pluto's, Pluto's transiting my south node right now. Oh, wonderful. In, in the so first a lot house. of letting go. Oh my God, about yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Letting go yeah. of your old stuff. Well, mm. Pluto is transiting my third, so. Oh, nice. <laughs> is, it, is it crossing any planets or? No, no, no. I don't have any planets in my third, but um, I think it's training my son. It's been training my son for a while. Okay. So. Well, at least there's a harmony there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, uh, get back a little to human design because I think most of uh, the viewers of this channel are really uh, at the very beginner level about the information about the human design. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share a random chart and you can tell what are the, all the lines. <laughs> all the... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, the channels. Yes. One second. You know, with human design, we have these centers. And of course, uh, each one of these centers uh, corresponds to a different uh, way of being. Um, and what's different about these centers from the normal um, uh, Hindu chakra system is that there's two extra two extra centers, which is the G center, that yellow diamond in the middle, mm -hmm. and the spleen, which is that uh, triangle on the left, yes. uh, the far left. Th these are the two extra centers. All the rest of them, the root, sacral, solar plexus, heart, throat, ajna, and head, those are the seven traditional uh, centers. Mm -hmm. but the, 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 addition, the addition of the G center and the, the spleen is actually a, a fascinating one. Um, it, it, and it creates a, a fascinatingly complete system. It really is comprehensive. I know to some people it can just look like a mess because <clears throat> there's so much going on here. But when you understand how to interpret it, it's, it's really a, a powerful thing. Um, part of the revelation, it, it, com it combines the four, uh, the four ancient uh, mystical systems of Kabbalah, uh, the Hindu chakra system, the I Ching, and Western astrology. Um, and it, 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 when you bring all of those together, it kind of goes click, and it, 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 there's something so perfect about it that, and, and uncanny that you just have to be like, hmm. Uh, the way it works is the I Ching, the codon wheel of the I Ching that some people might have seen, the, the wheel with all the hexagrams around it. Imagine putting that wheel around the zodiac itself with mm -hmm. the 10th with the 10th hexagram at the top right at the beginning of capricorn it kind of mm -hmm. the 10th hexagram kind of straddles capricorn like and then the you have the, house. Mm -hmm. right right then at the bottom you have the 15th hexagram and they're all situated so say you know if you look at uh ernst's <laughs> sun placement on the personality side okay it, that's within the 17th hexagram but it's within the sixth line of the 17th hexagram in aries i think 17 is in aries. yes um and that's why it's 17.6 uh because it's within the sixth line of the 17th hexagram so when you see the number after the point that number can only go to six it's not going to be like ever 17.8 okay. because the point is just the six lines and that's the first that, that's the calculation right when he was born, right when he, there was a separation of space between so the personality, him, right? The personality. Mm -hmm. And then you have the design calculation, which is exactly 88 degrees before that. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it's 88 degrees rather than 90 degrees, perfect 90 degrees is I, I a lot of things with this is it's hard to say why. <laughs> it, and it's like that. It's like that with astrology too. I think people know how it works. They just don't know why it works. Mm -hmm. um, and if you keep asking why, you'll, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy at a certain point. But all we do know is that it works. So, yes. And that's the, same thing with, that's the same thing with Ra getting this knowledge. Why is it 88 degrees? Well, it, it adds a certain continuity with profile and things like that. As you can see, the personality on Earth has uh, a six-line expression, mm -hmm. which is a big part of it, his experience. And then... The design side has a second line expression. So you could say he has a six-two profile, a six-line personality, 
and a second line unconscious because the design 88 degrees before you're born has a lot to do with uh, the unconscious body consciousness. It has a lot of momentum behind it. It's not, it doesn't need to think about things in the way we think about things. It's already kind of moving, mm -hmm. which is a, a powerful aspect to, to understand about human design. When you look at your design placements, other people might notice those things about you more than you notice them about you. Yes. Because <laughs> the, fact, the fact that your, your personality is in it, it's mm -hmm. like a fish in water. You know, if you ask a fish what it's like in water, they're just gonna be like, what water? That's <laughs> what it's like when you're, when you're in your design placements. Yes. You know how it is, uh, if you've ever seen, if no, you know, you've probably seen lots of video of yourself, but if somebody's never seen a video of themselves and they've never heard a recording of themselves speaking and suddenly they're seeing it, they're like, oh my God, that's how I look. That's, that's not I my sound. voice. <laughs> that's not my voice. That's not me. It doesn't sound like that in my head. Uh, but that's kind of like what your design placements are like to everyone else because they get to be outside of you and look at you and notice certain behaviors, certain proclivities certain char characteristics that you have that it's difficult for you to see because you're not kind of consciously operating from that place all the time. People mm -hmm. are predominantly uh, operating consciously from the, the personality placements because it's so on the surface. Yeah, it's something I... you readily identify with. The design placements are more like how you look, how you, how you behave with your body, what, what people can see about you on that level. Mm -hmm. um, which is a fascinating thing because that really has a lot to do with the unconscious and, and things you might not be fully conscious about, which is why it's so good to be around other people. And, you know, some people might tell you things about yourself. You're like, really? Am I really like that? Mm -hmm. and when you find human design, come to find out, yeah, you really are like that. Like if you look at the, the design placement over here with the design center, the 38.2 and the 39.2, other people might notice those things about Ernst more than he noticed those, that about himself. Mm -hmm. um, and what human design does is, is it can help show you what those are and, and you can more easily align with it. Um, it. It's a real fascinating thing, especially when you come at it from the angle of the gene keys again, like being able to look deeply into each hexagram concerning your cross and balancing that cross, going, going from it being a painful, you know, the saying everybody has their cross to bear uh, that, that's really the case with your incarnation cross. But when you understand really how it's working with the gene keys, he, he looks at the shadow, the shadows of each of the hexagrams. Then he looks at the gift of each of them. And then the Siddhi, which is a Sanskrit for divine gift. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you could say the gene keys is like a kind of shadow work. You have to understand the shadows first before you can release the gift within it because it's the same frequency. It's just like with uh, astrology, how you have negative aspects of Scorpio mm -hmm. and positive aspects of Scorpio or negative aspects of Aries and positive aspects of Aries. But in an interesting way, say like with Aries, um, with the arrogance, there's a gift in that arrogance. Even though it can be expressed in a negative way, it's, there's also a gift in it. And it's just like with these hexagrams, there's some possible negative stuff like with the 17, on this personality side mm -hmm. and the 18 uh mm -hmm. the, the the shadows of the 17 and the 18 are intellect and judgment now you might think how is intellect a shadow well w intellect is different than intelligence uh people yeah. can be really intellectual uh, actually the seven the shadow of the 17 is a uh, opinion the 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 opposite side of the channel of the 1762 which you can see between the ajna and the throat um, I know there's a lot of pieces and parts to this knowledge because for me, it's like a sec it's like a second language. I can just yeah. sort of dropping things. And, um, but, uh, the, the channel of the 1762, the 62 has the shadow of intellect. The 17 has the shadow of opinion. Um, and Richard deals a lot with that in each gene key. He'll talk about, he talks about the shadow for two or three pages and what that shadow may be like for the person who has their sun or their earth placement within that particular gene key. And it is highly mm -hmm. accurate. Um, and it, can, it, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I ask what are these little triangles and this star here? Like, okay. Uh, Those have to do with exalted and detriments. Ah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I see the nodes also have an exaltation and detriment because um, in I mean in the type that astrology that I use they don't have uh, exaltation and detriment. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't use them either, even though I'm more most familiar with Western astrology. Mm -hmm. I don't really pay attention to exaltations and detriments because it seems kind of limiting uh, to tell someone, oh, that's bad. It's just kind of a label saying, that's bad. It, well, it's like, well, what else about it? <laughs> we, we can start from so many different angles yes. rather than saying, that's bad, or this is not good, or this is a difficult thing. It's like, well, maybe it's a gift. Maybe there's, and I just kind of yeah. start something that. That, that they need to work on <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and this is part of the original uh revelation ragat mm -hmm. the exalted the exalted and detriments um with the hexagrams and the planets mm -hmm. because when he received this knowledge it, it, he was up for eight days mm -hmm. eight day, eight days straight receiving not just human design but having all kinds of wild experiences mm -hmm. um it's, it's a pretty wild story actually that, that connects to a lot of things uh, but but uh, um, I, I was curious, speaking of Ra, that uh, you say in a video that speaking of the four types, the four general types, uh, manifester, generator, projector, and reflector, mm -hmm. uh, that he only uh, s uh, started talking about these four types 10 years after he got the revelation. Right, right. If I understand correctly. So why do you think that is? Uh, well, he, he, he had to unpack it just like everybody else. And he admits in certain talks that he was, other people were helping him unpack it. Mm -hmm. Even pe people who were learned, learned astrologers. Mm -hmm. Um, he was learning a lot from, uh, uh, what's that famous astrologer woman's name? Green. Uh, what's her first name? Something green. Wait anyway, <laughs> she, 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 she's a, kind of a famous astrologer and, and, mm -hmm. uh, has written many books on it. And Ra would say, you know, I'm more interested, I would be more interested in reading her books on astrology than I would be about reading about uh, people's interpretations of planets with human design. Yes. So he, he would admit like, there, this is a combination of influences. So uh, taking everything he could from astrology and kind of working it into the meanings of human design to help paint a picture and unpacking it over years, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. Um, and that took a while until he, he got to a place where he's like, there's a lot of interest in it. And he wants, he, in a way he didn't want it to scare people with, yeah. the, with the complexity of it, you know, cause it is kind of complex. Uh, mm -hmm. and he wanted to make it as simple as humanly possible. There's positive things about that. And there's negative things about that, uh, yeah. cause it can be oversimplified. And that's one of the, the concerns I have with it where when things are overly simplified yes. and people are running around saying, uh, I'm a, I'm a five, one manifesting generator with the, this and the, that. And it doesn't, that it still doesn't tell me much about you. It's sort mm -hmm. of like if somebody were, were to sign every letter they wrote with, I'm a Capricorn with a Pisces moon. Yeah. So See what? <laughs> it's like, okay, there's so much more what houses are they in? What's on your, where are your nodes? You know, what, what's, there's so much more going on with, with all of that. Um, and it's the same thing with human design. There is so much detail to pay attention to, but, but it's accurate. It's accurate, highly accurate detail. Yes. But you know, there are, you know, some people who feel like limited by these four main categories. Like how do you start when you look at the chart, you look at these personality traits or do you look at their type, you know, if they're generator, manifester, etc. Because some people are like, oh, I'm a generator, so I can't lead. I'm a manifester, so I have to do this. Like, it's, right. really, it's so easy to limit yourself, just like with astrology. Like, I should mm -hmm. be like this if I have this. Right, so right. I think it's dangerous when, you know, astrology or human design or any such science becomes like a limiting fact. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, that definitely can happen. I mean, you know, it happened thousands of years ago too. say there was a, a download of knowledge that just came like maybe, you know, 3000 years ago, somebody had a revelation about Kabbalah or, or the Hebrew language and how it was, was structured esoterically. And it's a very fascinating story, even that one. And it's actually connected to human design too. I'm working on a video showing how they're, they're more deeply connected. Uh, but say that revelation happened and somebody is like trying to teach it, but then the next thing you know, other people are interpreting it in a wild way. And the next thing you know, cults are popping up here and there exactly. and people are <laughs> really terrible about the revelation. So 
that's kind of what happened uh, 2,000 years ago when they started burning libraries and like the library, like library of Alexandria. And it was more than just that library. There was like a campaign to destroy all knowledge uh, in, in Egypt and elsewhere. And uh, so what people did is they had to hide everything because these mm -hmm. cra crazy cults were taking over. So they had to make it occult and uh, hide it. <laughs> and, but we're at a time now, we're at a time now where it's like, we, we, we don't have to do that. Everything is kind of taking place online. Yes. Uh, there, there are no wars over human design. We're not going to go kill <laughs> a bunch of people because we, we believe in the best form of human design. Uh, so that's, that's good that that's not happening. But it is still kind of a, a battle going on, even, even within human design itself. itself. There's like inward struggle. Uh, people are trying to uh, figure out w what's going on with who, who to trust and uh, uh, who, who's giving the right courses or, you know, and, and all things like that, you know. So that's why I decided to like kind of pull into myself and teach it how I teach it. Of course, I, I do still use the word generator, manifestor, yeah. projector, because they're useful terms. You know, they, 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 they are kind of useful. I just don't hammer on them. And I don't hammer on things like strategy and authority. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't tell people right away that they're not self. And I don't even use that word when I'm giving sessions with people. I don't. It's so never, harsh to hear that yeah, you're not self. Like exactly. <laughs> uh, I never say. I never even bring it up with people. What I talk about is energy dynamics, and I give them the most, uh, the the most benefit of the doubt. You know, like I don't know. Like who am I to assume that they are somehow less evolved than me just because I've been into human design for eight years or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's so much out there in terms of psychological breakthroughs that have happened in, in the last 100 years and so many revelations like i said that human design is a powerful part of it but it's not the only part so i like combining them like in my circuitry and beyond video yes uh, that, that that's you a watch. very I, thorough video <laughs> yeah it, it took me like a year and a half to to piece all that together because i i'm looking at not only human design but astrology Cards, and tarot. tarot cards, uh, a little bit of Hebrew to help understand uh, some uh, mystical things, philosophy, um, some aspects of uh, psychology, you could say, and we're seeing how human design works in the big picture, mm -hmm. not not the, not the little tiny narrow picture of you got to join my human design cult, otherwise you're not self, <laughs> you know, I just don't, I don't like talking to people like that. I, I want, I want this knowledge to be opened up for as many people as possible. And it's still, it's so new that it's got to require some work. I mean, um, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing the best I can as a single person yes. to, to work with it in the, in the way I can, you know. Um, but, so, just yeah, to come back a little to this. So uh, the, the, the auras, the chakras, sorry, that are not colored, they are open. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are colored are consistent. So yeah, defined. Defined, so they're more consistent. So, you know, like um, it's usually said that you, it's not so good to have them open because then you follow other people and they mm -hmm. influence you in the manifestation of these. Mm. Uh, like, yeah. how do you see that? Uh, well, yeah, when you look at defined centers, they are more consistent. It's what you wake up with in the morning and go to bed with at night. It's always there. And that means that it gets a lot of practice every day. It's like you're practicing your definitions and you get really good at them over time. Uh, like I have the 1156 between the Ajna and the throat. And that's mm -hmm. a story, that's a storytelling channel. Mm -hmm. And people with that channel usually have good speaking voices and can move through concepts and just kind of have fun uh, with telling stories about this, that, or the other thing. Um, and you could say that I, I didn't, with all my genius or whatever, just like do this through a bunch of hard work. And I had to teach myself how to do this or have this talent. It's, it's just there. And it's been practicing itself mm -hmm. my whole life. I, I don't, I don't have to touch it. Um, and <clears throat> the thing with conditioning that can happen is if you have an open center or an undefined center, um, I mean, technically it's open if it's totally open, like Ernst here has an open throat. Yes. So, cause there is no definition in it. There's no, active gates mm -hmm. but in his ajna his ajna even though it's undefined he has a couple gates in it so you would call that undefined you wouldn't call it open but that's just like a 
um, a human design thing that you might read in human design uh, literature. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't get too caught up in, in being so strict with that. I just figured I'd throw it out there. So if you have an, if you have an undefined center, that's mm -hmm. sort of like, uh, I, I talk about it in terms of an empty bucket. Uh, if you have an empty bucket and somebody walks up to it with a definition that you don't have, it's kind of like a voice in an empty bucket, how it creates a reverberation. It goes, mm -hmm. woo, woo, and you can hear it like, it's even louder, it amplifies. And that's the kind of thing that happens with an undefined center. It's an amplification that takes place when somebody who has definition there suddenly comes into your aura, it's like, and you can feel it really uh, powerfully. You know, um, say somebody has a defined head center and a defined ajna, and you don't, and suddenly they're in your aura. You might be uh, feeling their reverberations of their thought processes quite a bit. And you mm -hmm. can go on, a, you can go on quite a trip with them, <laughs> but where conditioning takes place is where you think you're missing something, or maybe I should try to be like this person. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of, that kind of thing can happen with emulation. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with like, people do this all the time when they're a teenager, they hang posters of their favorite bands yes. on their walls and they have their favorite movie stars or something. Cause they like, they really like uh, their characteristics or how they talk or how mm -hmm. they look or their creative process. But emulation is okay when it's like a, a role model kind of thing. But when you start to think that there's something wrong with you because you don't have necessarily what another person has, that's where conditioning can come in with things like human design. Um, you know, say for example, uh, Ernst has this, these channels between the G center and the spleen and the sacral. Now that's a really powerful definition there that really kind of locks him into his um, experience. It makes him very secure feeling. He has a lot of direction. Um, mm -hmm. He has a lot of passion with his own behavior and creativity. Uh, loving what you create and creating what you love and having a lot of juice for work uh, with the 3457 mm -hmm. channel between the spleen and the the sacral people with that channel have so much juice for work they could they could juggle all, all kinds of work and just keep going he's um, just like that he's just relentless <laughs> yeah people with that channel are like uh, i talk about in my circuitry video frank zappa had that channel and he was a relentless he was, a, <laughs> yeah, relentless. He was not stopping he would drive people so hard that's just one story in that, in that short video i show you know he'd be up for two or three days working and, mm -hmm. and it, he, all these musicians around him were like, Frank, I need, I need to sleep <laughs> for five like hours. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, you'll be back here in three hours. And he's still pumping away, you know, when they get back. And he was like that for many years, you know, because he was so passionate about what he was doing. So mm -hmm. you could say Ernst has a, a few of the same things Frank had with the 1057 between the G center and the, the spleen. That, that center is very... Um, uh, much concerned with its creative behavior and its sense of uh, creativity and, and uh, doing, doing the work for, for the joy of the work itself. It's, it's a really uh, yes. fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does it matter if it's red with, if it's the design or black, the personality or intertwined, like how does that affect it? Um, you could say that the, the 57 is something like it's got more momentum that he doesn't have to really think about so much. It's not going to be something that's, so much con uh, consciously being apprehended all the time mm -hmm. but when you look at when you look at the 10 what do you have what does he have in his 10 that's where his moon is um, um, so his, his moon placement is in capricorn 10.4 yes, right right yes, at the beginning capricorn. Of capricorn. Mm -hmm. and the second hexagram is uh, uh the mars which is in taurus uh so yes. you mars could say and saturn in taurus mm -hmm. so you could say those are really conscious aspects of himself. But when you look at the 14 and the sacral with uh, his uh, design Neptune and the 57 and the spleen with his design moon, those are more, it doesn't mean that he cannot apprehend them ever. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this whole thing with the Jungian psychology about making the unconscious conscious, right? Mm -hmm. You could sort of look at it like that uh, with the design placements. When you're aware of them and you realize it's just going, then you can let go of the, let go of the oars, so to speak, of the boat and yeah. stop trying to paddle against the current and just kind of let it go and uh, get rid of resistance in life because that's really what it's all about, whether yeah. you're looking at 
personality. Honestly, honestly, I thought that he would be a manifester, like the way he behaves and the way I know him. And when mm. I saw he was a generator, I was really surprised because I, I'm very, very new at human design. So I thought, mm. okay, like he's like sort of a leader, a pioneer. So I thought right. he, <laughs> but then. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, there's, there, there's a lot of things going on with that. Like you, you thought he would be a manifester, right? Yeah. Yes. But when you look at his body graph, he has a totally undefined throat. And the thing mm -hmm. about manifestors is that they have a motor getting to the throat. Um, the motors, the four motors in human design are the root, the, the, the brown square at the very bottom, the sacral, mm -hmm. which is one above that, the solar plexus on the far right, and the heart center, that little triangle. Uh, yeah, so those are the four motors. The reason they're called motors is that there is a lot of dynamic energy within them. Um, you wouldn't say the spleen is a motor because the spleen has, well, we could get into a lot about that. Most of the gates of the spleen are in uh, Libra and they have the, the lower trigram of wind. So it's kind of like more of a intuitive thing with the spleen. It's very light. It's not like a, a generative dynamic uh, energy that's coming out. Mm -hmm. So these other centers that these four motors, if you have one of those getting to the throat, which is about manifestation, and expression, then there's an impetus within these people to express a lot um, and to get a lot out into the world. And they're always moving, they're always doing something. A key, a key word for manifestors is doing, but that doesn't mean that people who don't have a motor getting through the throat, it doesn't mean they can't do or that they're not doing or anything like that. Like if you look at Ernst here, he just has a lot of energy for work and he enjoys his own creations and being creative, like with the 1057, you know, uh, the 214 is empowering direction in others. You know, that's what that channel does. He might be empowering direction, change of direction in people's lives just by standing next to them. Yes, uh, that, he's a very strong personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's something that happens. But the thing, you could sort of tell when, when, you get, when you get further into it and you might meet a manifester and you get to know mm -hmm. manifestors, there is something about their aura that it can be quite repelling. I'm and a manifester. Oh, you are? Oh, wow. <laughs> it, but I was about to say, of course, I have to always say this, uh, like, it's not a bad thing. It's not. You know, <laughs> it's fine. It, it doesn't mean you get rid of, like, you have to push everybody out of the way. But there is something about it, like... Um, there are certain things that you, you bring up to a manifester that they're like, that's exactly what it was like when I was young. Say a manifester child just wants to go and do what they want to yes. do in the moment they want to do it. Exactly. And they get in trouble for it because they're not informing. Like there's a thing about manifestors where just to help everybody else around them to, to inform people of what you're doing, because people always want to know what a manifestor is up to because their aura just has this thing about doing they'll just leave without telling people where they're going, what they're doing. Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because it's your right. You know, you have this energy getting to the throat. It's very spontaneous. There's this impetus to act right now. It's, it, so why would you have to tell people about something that's already so naturally just like, you know, just take off and go to the store. Yes, without it's, telling not, anybody it's not like you're, you're doing something bad. Like you said, just take off and go to the store or something. But people are like, why? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't know. know. <laughs> people are obsessed. I call it, uh, I call it, what's the manifestor doing condition? Uh, <laughs> exactly. When they, when they just take off, you're just like, where, what? You know, it's like they just disappeared. And it's, it's the worst for parents when you have a manifestor child and they're like six years old, they decide to just open up the door and go walk through town alone. <laughs> and, you know, they come back and the mother's like, where were you? you, you yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. I'm a manifestor. I'm allowed to just do whatever I want. The key words being do, do whatever I want. Um, people with an undefined throat, it's not it, like, say, for example, Ernst. Um, that it, it's just a different kind of dynamic you know it can seem subtle sometimes but he has a really powerful body graph um and he is manifesting a lot right even though he has an undefined throat yeah. that, that this is where human design could get dangerous because say the throat is all about manifestation and mm -hmm. and uh, uh expression then I've, I've seen this actually happen people have told me this people who even people who are certified are telling people weird stuff like this oh you have a you have a totally open throat that means you, you don't manifest things. 
Yeah, yeah you that shouldn't. Means... That's so horrible to tell somebody, like, especially when they're younger, like, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. Right. Or the fact that he has an undefined ajna telling him mm -hmm. that all his thoughts are meaningless. Yeah. Uh, you have an undefined ajna. That means all your thoughts are random and meaningless and nothing really uh, uh, concrete can come through that's meaningful. Uh, that's, that is so bad. And it, it's bothered me for years that this kind of thing is being taught. Uh, and it, even by certified practitioners, you know, like this kind of thing, this is why I'm like, okay, this, something is wrong with how this is being taught and, and how, how, it's, how people are uh, being indoctrinated with it. Uh, you kind of need, it's almost like you gotta, you gotta have a little bit of a discernment. Yes. In, in, in coming in. <laughs> so normally the generator strategy would be to respond so they have to wait to be invited to do something <laughs> right right yeah yeah like you have to wait forever it's a like the response thing is a real thing um when you when you wait to respond to what feels good everything mm -hmm. is usually great and i i did a generator video where i talked about you know if you have a defined sacral mm -hmm. um it it radiates and it also uh it also attracts. So it's kind of like two things at the same time. I sort of brought this up in the circuitry video. Mm -hmm. It radiates and attracts at the same time. What makes generators frustrated is they don't know what's going and what's coming. They don't know what to do with their energy. And it can be difficult to be patient in understanding the power of your sacral. Like things are coming to you, right? Things are coming to you and you will be able to respond to the right thing uh, when, when it does come um, and it, it's attracted to you. And then you'll have enough energy for it. You'll have certainty with your energy. You'll know what you're doing. You'll be able to jump right into it w when you're in alignment. And that's what it's like with everybody. It's about just when you're in alignment, suddenly you have all the energy you need. Suddenly everything is great. But I've had experiences where even though everything might be up in my head and I might want to create a page about something, even though I know it all and I, I could start it for some reason, the energy just isn't there yet. So I, I have to wait. And sometimes I've even tried to force myself just to do it. And, but for some reason it won't happen. Uh, it just will not come out of my fingers. So it's not but, responding to other people, but more to yourself. Right. Right. And there, there could be a lot in terms of uh, transits taking place, you know, yes. uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot going on in terms of guides, what would be best for you and your guides know that. Like it, even though you can't hear them all the time, this is why faith is important uh, and, and having yes. faith in a higher power and stuff like that. Like just because everything is not happening right now, you know that there's a part of you or a part of the universe that does have your best interests at heart. And if you have enough faith, like, you know, this thing you're pushing so hard for right now in three months, it's going to be perfect. It's <laughs> going to be perfect in three months if you can wait and have faith and just keep doing what you're doing and just be as patient as you can. And this is kind of like a generator thing. Uh, we don't need to manifest everything right now. We can mm -hmm. be patient and with our passions and just kind of work your craft or, you know, doing whatever. But again, I don't like pigeonholing too much because then that's, that sounds like a, Oh, if you don't have a defined sacral, that means you can't be passionate. You shouldn't be working on anything you're passionate about. No. Uh, what it has to do with is if you have an undefined sacral, the consistency is different. Yes. You, you, might, you might overwork yourself. It's, it's very possible for somebody with an undefined sacral to overwork themselves. Because just like I said, with open centers, when, when somebody comes into your aura and, and has something that you don't have, it reverberates and it amplifies. People with undefined sacrals, they're, they're like really uh, pumped up by all the generators in the world. You know, there's so many of them. And when they're around them, it's just like a... Mm -hmm. And they figure, wow, because the fact that it's amplified, they figure they can just go swinging through the jungle like Tarzan, and they can in many cases. But sometimes they can take it too far, and, and, and it can lead to burnout. Um, but I've seen some projectors who are really hardworking, and they don't end up destroying themselves, like Jackie Chan, for example. Mm -hmm. He does all his own stunts. He's an amazing martial artist. He's done all these movies, and he's a projector. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see him falling apart. He's doing great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, but he, he does have a he does have a projector thing about him, the way he break dances through all this stuff and, and it, it's really really precise and really focused. It's a interesting thing. 
I was curious that um, uh, charts that have uh, like five or six defined centers are more powerful because they're more consistent. Mm. Um, or yeah, not necessarily. Another, yeah, that's another thing with language, uh, more and more and less. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen people with charts that have every single center defined. Um, wow. And they are really full of themselves. Uh. <laughs> and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. Mm -hmm. It just means that it, it's different. You know, they don't, they don't need people in the same way other people might need people in, mm -hmm. in order to learn something new or, or to experience something new. They could, their, their uh, experience with others is, is on a different frequency. You know, it doesn't mean they can't fall in love. It doesn't mean they can't learn new things. It just means there's kind of a completeness about them. Uh -huh. that, that, fascinating thing to be around um and it's the same thing with you know uh say somebody has a totally undefined body graph a reflector mm -hmm. <laughs> these people i mean they, they can be shocked and feel like what's there's something wrong with me everybody's got all these uh body graphs that are lit up like christmas trees and it looks so <laughs> pretty when i look at other people's body graphs but when i look at mine it's like what does that mean but I'm a ghost. i tell them yeah exactly i'm a ghost i'm not even here uh but there's a thing about reflectors about uh, being able to read other people's energy really, really well, because the fact if they're totally open and they're just a walking bucket and they can feel everybody's amplifications, they, they can sample everything and they can see where things could be taken up a notch. They can really read other people very well energetically. They can see where things can be elevated to a more um, harmonious level. You know, if things are disharmonious or and things like that, they can they can really uh, see and sample all of that and, and help other people and be of service in that way. You know, and plus there's so many other elements with human design that we you can look at with a project with a reflector that doesn't have anything to do with um, they're not having any channels. We yeah. can look at the substructure of the lines, um, which is a real fascinating aspect that I've been getting deeply into. Uh, that's that's really fun. How much does the cross weigh in, in the incarnation cross in the person's, you know, makeup or how, how much does it say about the person? Um, in human design, they say it makes up about 70% of your genetic wow. expression. Yeah, 70%. So it's more than the four types. <laughs> so that's right, like right. the main thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the places I start. It depends because every time I do a reading, I ask how long have you been into this knowledge? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, how long, how much do you know? Oh, so you do know your profile. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of got to gauge where people are. Um, if they're really advanced and they already know all their profile and stuff, I can be like, okay, well, let's start t talking about other things. Yes. Uh, but if somebody's just found it yesterday, I got to start from square one. Yes. You know? um, but the incarnation cross is a big part of a, of a person's experience. You could say that, there's different ways of looking at it. Of course, there's a language problem uh, because s people say a lot of times, I am a generator. I mm -hmm. have this cross. I am a 6'2 profile. It's like, yeah, you are, but are, are you those things? Is that what you are? Because when you get into like uh, a lot of the material of these enlightened beings that are on the planet, you're, you're not, you're disidentified with form. Mm -hmm. And all these uh, labels that we have that's your that's your true eternal timeless boundless self right you're the bornless part of you but human design is funny because it's so tempting to look at it because it's so seductive and there's all yeah. these interests to be like i'm this and i am that oh my god and it's so accurate too so you're like okay this is a very form-based knowledge that rod said is based on the crystals of consciousness that's what mm -hmm. the voice told him that was giving them this knowledge crystals of consciousness so there is a form element to it, um, but there's a, a little trick, I think, that human design is going to be teaching people in the future. When you identify too much with it, it'll put you in a little box that's difficult yes. to get out of. <laughs> um, but if you can use it as a tool and a, a, kind of like a tool of appreciation, you can appreciate your differentiated experience and be able to just go, go along for the ride, right? And the cross is a good example because that can be some of the most heavy stuff ever because the cross crosses are heavy, you know, squares are heavy. Mm -hmm. And since it makes up most of your experience, um, it's easy to say, I am the sufferer. I am the one 
who's nailed on the cross. I, I'm the one who, who's carrying this. But the spiritualization of that is uh, a kind of a being able to be an observer and disidentifying so much with the, the suffering uh, heavy aspect of it and kind of spiritualizing it like it talks about in the Gene Keys and getting more into the gift, which is just basically a higher frequency. It's more light. You're lightly touching it. It's the same code, but you're not, it doesn't feel like a burden. It's more like an appreciation, like, oh, it just goes. This is just how it is. And um, a lot of people experience some amazing transmutations and, and, and uh, transformations with getting into Gene Keys. I, I remember reading Richard's saying that people who get into the Gene Keys and they, they understand their incarnation cross, eventually uh, it, addictions can just fall away magically. Wow. I think addiction can just go away because your higher frequencies are coming into your genetic expression to where what you were using as an addictive thing just kind of doesn't make sense anymore and it just goes away. That happened to me, actually. I, I quit drinking after I had an experience with the Gene Keys after four months or so of being into it something happened. I, a lot of energy started pouring into me. Uh, a lot of anomalous things started happening. I started experiencing uh, energy in my sacral. And I was just like, Ooh. and this happened for many, many months, like every, every uh, minute or every few seconds, sometimes I would get this uh, feeling in my stomach and my sacral that was just like, Ooh. and it, it was happening so consistently on top of that, my, my frequency was getting so high. It's like, I cannot drink anymore, literally. I, I just can't, and I, I haven't. Uh, it's something I just, I just can't do. Uh, and that's good because I've been wanting to quit for a long time, and it was, I was always finding it difficult. And, um, but this kind of just went boop because of the, of the heightened frequency I was bringing into myself. You know, to, to drink at all, it didn't even feel like alcohol anymore. It felt like poison because mm -hmm. like, my awareness was getting so much more sharp that to dull it down or to make it uh, cloudy felt like such a disrespect and a dishonoring of my, my core self. It was just, it did not feel like a fun, good time yes. ever at all anymore. And it's like that with a lot of people. It's fascinating that Richard says, yeah, that's something that can happen to people when they start getting into their gene keys. Um, wow. That's so, so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really powerful. It's like a, laser laser point precision when you want to look at your cross right yeah it doesn't mean it's better than astrology um it just means that you can really narrow it down and, and look at it because there's a lot of difference between the degrees and the 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 uh the lines of the hexagram actually it's it's, it's amazing how you can see it uh, the difference in degrees so for here for instance what does this mean the left angle cross of upheaval these and are how terms, many crosses are there uh i don't know exactly how many crosses there are um many <laughs> yeah there, there's quite a few but i haven't gotten that i've memorized quite a bit of it but there's yes. a, lot, a lot to memorize with with this whole system but mm -hmm. um, the, these names of the crosses that ra came up with they're basically just descriptive words and he, okay. he was quite he was quite adept at finding descriptive words for things um, that's what he did with the Ray V Ching, uh, where he came up with one word for every line of every hexagram. Yeah, I think uh, the voice was right to approach somebody who worked in advertising because he would find a good word. <laughs> right, right. Find a good way to kind of uh, sell it. Yes. Uh, it, it works, but even so, though sometimes you might not agree with it because sometimes mm -hmm. there's false advertising. You know, you watch shampoo commercials and say the shampoo com commercials that say it's getting into the the molecules Monica, of your hair yeah. <laughs> and changing it magically. It's like, yes. I don't think shampoo does that. It's the same <laughs> thing with human design. Like sometimes you see things and it's like, I don't know, say for example, you're flipping through the Di science of differentiation book mm -hmm. and it says uh, something about the, the second line of the 52nd hexagram or something like this. And it, and it says bigot. That's all it says, bigot. Mm -hmm. And you're like, and say your son is in that, that line of that hexagram and you'd be like does that mean i'm a bigot i guess i'm a bigot <laughs> uh there, there's so much more to understand about yourself that's why i don't pay attention so much to these words um yes. you know and the same thing with the incarnation crosses there's there's reasons he came up with those words uh you know left angle cross of upheaval there's reasons that it's called left angle you know that are that are true uh but you know when you look at things like upheaval 
that's that's an interesting thing. It could have a lot to do with the fact that the uh, design sun Earth, the thirty eight thirty nine, is it within the root, mm -hmm. within the root center, the thirty eight thirty nine, and th those are very powerful individual gates. Now, individual channels are mutative. They they have a lot to do with being an individual and empowering individuality in other people. And Ernst has that quite a lot in his body graph here, like quite mm -hmm. a lot. He's got the 214, the 1057, the 3457, and his son Earth, his design son Earth is within the 3839. So this is like powerful individual stuff that is going its own way. It's cutting, it, it's cutting a path through the jungle. Yes, exactly. And it can empower other people when they're around it. They're like, whoa, maybe I can cut a way through a jungle too. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to follow what everybody else is doing in a collective sense. Um, and, you know, he's also got the 2838 between the uh, spleen and the root. That's another powerful individual channel that needs to find purpose and meaning for its, its struggle. Uh, and basically transmuting struggle into uh, perseverance and being able to persevere and, and move through things. So having all this individual stuff is really powerful for him. So, upheaval you could say the patterns that he sees with the 1718 personality sun earth those those two placements with the 17 in the ajna and the 18 in the spleen um <clears throat> the 1718 are both logical gates and logical gates have to do with patterns finding patterns setting patterns being very good at finding patterns especially with the 17, because it's in, it's in the Ajna, which has to do with seeing. So being able to see patterns, organize patterns. This is kind of like logical circuitry and logical circuitry is also connected to alpha energy, leading, showing a way, showing a way forward that is shared because it's collective. So him having his son earth within the 17, 18, it's like showing a pattern, finding a pattern, being able to set the pattern. Mm -hmm. But the, the upheaval part of all this could very much come from the 3839, which is so individual that it's like disrupting patterns. Like, no, it doesn't have to be like this. We'll, we'll set our own uh, pattern. We'll, we'll go our own course. And then uh, kind of like charting your own course in yes. that way. That might, that might seem heretical. Um, it does. You know, I, I'm just going to say that, you know, this teacher, uh, like um, he didn't like the translation of some ancient text, so he decided to translate himself. And he uses right. a different system of astrology that he's being called a heretic by the traditional astrologers in this <laughs> system. <laughs> really, they really, they, he gets so much hate. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, yeah. So he's causing some upheaval. Yes. There. Um, <laughs> And when you look at that and you combine it with, this is what's fun about human design. You, you take it all together. Like, yeah, left angle cross of upheaval. He also has the 214 between the G center and the sacral, charting his own course, affecting direction in other people. Uh, 1057 and having passion with his own creations. The 3410 being very centered within himself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a very much, that's, 3410 is a funny thing. Like they're just so centered within themselves and they wish other people would be too. Uh, the, the 3457, lots of juice for work. That, that 1858 is a funny one between the, the, the spleen and the root. The 1858 channel of judgment, which is collective. That channel is an interesting one because the reason it's called the channel of judgment is it's, it's logical, which means it's finding patterns, but it's, it's, it's judging patterns as well. It wishes that there would just be a smooth running operation without there being interruptions mm -hmm. in the pattern, the pattern being set. That's why it's called judgment. People with that channel are quick to judge, quote unquote. But at the higher frequencies, when you learn with the gene keys, it's more about integrity. You want to test the integrity of things because you want, you want things to be able to hold up. It's sort of like if somebody's building a bridge, you want it to be able to hold the weight of the cars that are going across it. It has to have integrity in its structure. Things have to be balanced just right. And for people with an 1858, they're concerned with it. <laughs> they're very concerned with the structure. Is it going to hold? They're yes. testing the integrity. He's testing very integrity concerned with testing. He does so much testing before putting something out, like really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really important because they want it to float, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, yeah, that's really an important. 
Yeah. So interesting. <laughs> how, how many things? So I was curious. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this uh, okay. uh, image. I was curious how you integrate this human design knowledge in your everyday life. Because I saw some people say, like, if you're a manifester, you should eat like this. Or if you're like this, you should sleep like this. How yeah, yeah, there's lots of rules uh, and, and codes of behavior that need to be followed. Otherwise, you're not self and all this. I just don't even go there. I don't, I don't go there okay. with people. Um, and in terms of every day, I see it as contemplation. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think awareness all by itself is given as much credit as it truly deserves. You know, mm -hmm. when you're aware, when you're simply aware of things, all kinds of things can start shifting. All kinds of things. This is, sort of gets in line with the law of attraction stuff. You know, when your consciousness change changes, your reality begins to change. And that's was my experience. I guess you could say I'm lucky because I found the gene keys first, which mm -hmm. is all about that. You know, changing your perspective. Next thing you know, the, the world changes. Mm -hmm. So with human design, that's kind of how I operate with it too. It's a contemplation exercise. There are certain things you can do to where, you know, it's all about looking in the mirror. It's like a mirror, you know, when yes. you look at it, it's like, well, this is me. Now I can just be unapologetically me and I can just be that, but it doesn't mean you have to like work really hard to be you and that there needs to be a, 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 a really strict, thing that you need to do in order to be you a lot of this a lot of what uh i see human design people complain about in terms of um where you're at and where you you want to be with being strict with human design they're just basically talking about the human condition mm -hmm. and they have it too and if they want to pretend they don't have it and that they're they're un, uninfected and everybody else is a zombie <laughs> That's, that's so false and it's really arrogant and to assume that you're somehow elevated above, above everybody else because you've been experimenting with strategy and authority and your, your, your life is somehow better or more exalted or something more, yes. more powerful and meaningful than other people. Uh, that is so um, just flat out arrogant. I just don't even go there. I don't even assume that about people. You're unevolved, unevolved and I'm evolved. You're a seven centered being and I'm a nine centered exalted human design being, um, I've noticed that. It, and it's just something that needs to be said. You know, a lot of people who get into human design, they're, they're, they, don't, they haven't studied very much of other things. Yes. And human design can seem like the ultimate cheat sheet. Like, oh, it's all right here. I don't need to learn about signs and elements and cards and psychology and this. I, they, don't even, they don't even have much work to show for other things. But suddenly they get human design and suddenly it blows their mind. I mean, it is mind blowing. You got to yes. give them that. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's accurate. It's fascinating. But if they have nothing else that, that, that they've worked on in order to correlate it to other things, then it, it will put you in a very narrow uh, place because it's just the power of it. Uh, it is a very, very powerful thing. And if you give this to somebody who hasn't had much experience with other things, even if they have, it's, it seems kind of like superficial experience because I've seen people talk like they just throw everything away. You know, yeah. before human design, I was, I tried tarot, I tried astrology and nothing worked for me. It's like, well, I, I don't think you looked into it deeply enough. Yeah, you can integrate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've been helped immensely with astrology because you have to, it's a, it's a discipline. You yeah. have to apply yourself. You don't just like get a, a cheap reading online and be like, oh, yeah. I'm a Scorpio and yeah, that doesn't exactly. do anything for me. It's like, no, 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 this is, there, there's been compendiums written about this. You got to like, and there, there's so much to it that can help uh, understanding trans transits. But I, I know that it can seem like a, a totally different language and, and it can seem complicated. You know, you look at a, an astrology chart, it's hard to s understand what all these mean for you individually. Um, but when you look at human design, it's so black and white. Mm -hmm. it's so right, right there in your face, there's no really, there's not much need for interpretation. Um, but there, there is, you know, you have, like I talk about in the circuitry video and so important, it's so important to take all, everything together um, and to put it all together. And it's not that hard, you know, it might be hard in terms of the memorization and trying to learn everything. Um, but we're all here to help each other and support each other. You know, when you look at my body graph, I'm expressing myself in the way that I am and it's all perfectly in line with my body graph. Mm -hmm. um, and I could share that and empower people in the way that I am with, with how, with my definitions, you can do the same thing being a manifester. You could uh, get things going and initiate things with other people 
you know, you contacted me for this. I'm like, yes, let's go. And that, that's kind of a manifest for thing. Like, let's do this. Boom. Let's do this. Boom. And that's cool. I'm not really like that, but it's cool to be, have a manifester who is like that, who can just pick it up and run with it, you know, without having to wait and see how they, <laughs> they you know, how they feel first or something. Uh, and that, that's cool. I like that. And I think human design is here to help humanity come into progressively more and more alignment in that way, in terms of understanding each other, working with each other. I mean, one of the most powerful things I've seen with human design is understanding family dynamics mm, and relationships. Compatibility, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you could look at, if you've had problems with your family, suddenly you look at everybody's body graph and it's like, oh, that's why. I don't need to take it so personally. They're just like that. And that's how they are, <laughs> you know, and it's same thing with you, you know, and you can see why you're different. Why, why some people might've had an issue with you. Why you always got to be like that? Why are you like this? It's like, well, I have a three, five profile. I got this and I got that. Um, and that's kind of how it is. You know, you can really see it. Some people with a lot of collective uh, gates or collective circuitry, they might feel kind of put off by all this individual stuff. Somebody mm. like me with a lot of individual things going on they might be like why don't you just conform why why do you got to be so such a rebel and mm -hmm. it's just how it is i mean i, I can't <laughs> i can't conform i don't think i could conform if i tried so <laughs> and when you understand it, it, it makes everything so much easier you don't take things personally it's not that i have character defects necessarily even though yeah you want to work on yourself and better understand and heal and all that which is a big a big uh it's a big theme of the time we're moving through right now is healing um as much as we can because of the the, tran the transition we're moving through yes uh, i think human des human design can help with that absolutely if we see it in a holistic way and not, not be as judgmental and, and uh, rigid and strict with it yeah i was i was curious if in human design twins have the same charts Actually, Ra talked about this when he started introducing uh, the substructures of the lines. Uh, after, after like, I think it was like after 12 or 13, somewhere around there, years of teaching human design, he came out and told someone that there, there was more. Uh, there were substructures to the lines of the hexagram that he needed to teach. And they were just like, excuse me, there's more, <laughs> there's more. He's like, yeah, there's within each line of a hexagram within each line of a hexagram you have six colors within each color you have six tones and within each tone you have five bases and that's a lot of that's a lot of information and he he started uh, unpack, unpacking this in his phs courses uh which i've i've went through over and over and I, i've shared some of it uh just because i want people to have an understanding of what's going on with it um yeah, it's it's a it, it, that's a powerful aspect of the of the knowledge. I forgot what your original question was about it. If if twins have uh, identical charts. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why uh, because with it with a line of a hexagram, that's about eighteen hours of arc. Yes. Eighteen hours. When you get to colors, uh, color is about uh, a color is about like a, a couple hours. When you get to tone, that's uh, uh, like fifteen minutes. But when you get to the base, that's minutes. Yes. And you can see differences if, uh, if one baby comes out and another one comes out like, you know, five minutes later, you might think that they're born at the same time. But when you look at this level of human design with base and even tone, you can see differences. You can see it between the people. And if, if I had them in front of me, I would be able to explain it to them. Yes. But, but, but uh, correct birth time would really be that's necessary. so interesting because in Vedic astrology we also have these divisional charts like we split the sign in several divisions and the most accurate is like the 60th divisional chart so we split it in 60 so the oh, birth wow. time has to be like super accurate like really to yeah, the minute let's go beyond uh, human design a little bit and um, you reference Krishnamurti in many of your videos so how did you come to know the, the teachings of Krishnamurti? Um, UG, UG Krishnamurti, right? Because mm -hmm. there's also J Krishnamurti and, and mm -hmm. uh, people think they're sometimes think they're related, but they're, they're not related. Um, I, I, I admire and appreciate J Krishnamurti. I haven't gotten deeply into his uh, work so, so much, but I've uh, watched some videos and I, I like what he has to say and all that. 
but UG Krishnamurti is a whole other phenomenon, a, a whole other animal, you could say, uh, because he is an animal. And that's, that's what's fascinating about him. I, I found out about UG Krishnamurti uh, uh, like years and years ago, like 10 years ago or something. Mm-hmm. And I, just, I always I found his writings to be really fascinating because he's basically he's talking about things from an enlightened point of view, but he's less nice about it. He's more upfront about it, and he, he's more of a. I mean, he can be a kind person. He he's sort of funny. He can oscillate between being very kind and then just like, you know, throwing things like upside down. Uh, sometimes like it, it just depends on the person. Uh, and like, I just like reading what he had to say about how our minds work and how we basically live in a mental matrix that is pretty much hopeless. He, he doesn't mince words. He's like, you're in a hopeless situation uh, and there is no way out. So what you want to, you want me to do some magic on you? Like, kind of like, uh, and I'd like how he just kind of gets into that how, how it happens and uh, how it happened for him. I like reading about his relentless, relentless search for self, right, and meaning with self. And I talk about that in my circuitry and beyond video. This relentless search. He just kept searching and searching and searching until, poof, nothing. Like, and he said it almost killed him. Uh, his his body kind of imploded. He said he said it felt like miniature atomic bombs going off in his whole being, like that were just, it was destroying everything, every pattern of self, every identification with self, every pattern of, of identification with uh, all these patterns of, of, of ways of thinking and being and living that, that are about, about finding myself, wanting enlightenment, what's the meaning of life, you know, uh, wanting to find meaning in, in things and all of that just, now different people come to that in different ways you know, uh, they might come to that in different ways. I just the other day looked at how Muji uh, had his awakening, listening to his story. I like his story. It's really interesting how it just kind of happened. And he uh, went to see Papaji and uh, it, it like, he said, Papaji murdered him. He's like, he just murdered me. And he was really upset. And then uh, something happened the next day to where he, he just disappeared. His, his self disappeared, but at the same time, he's still here. That's the kind of paradox. And that's kind of what happened to Yuji. He disappeared. There is no Yuji anywhere. There is no self. There's no self to realize. There is no enlightenment, but he, here you are and fully, you know, uh, aware and experiencing the world and the senses are operating in a really powerful way. Um, I just think Yuji is an interesting case study of uh, a kind of mutation that is going to be coming more and more to people in different ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I really, I really feel that that's, that's on the horizon. I mean, it's, I think it's actually happening. Um, I'm having anomalous experiences. Other people are having interesting, strange experiences uh, Mm -hmm. that seem to come out of nowhere. And that seem to have nothing to do with anything I do. And that seem to have nothing to do with, um, my ego you could say like even though you could say it's connected but i don't know you speaking, you, speaking yeah, about the profound experiences you mentioned in some videos that you had some profound experience but you know it's like you, it's difficult to talk about them because you can't really describe with words mm-hmm. <laughs> it happened yeah. to me also when mm-hmm. you know i met an avatar mother mira in this like when i you know also i had the need not to talk and people were asking me so how did you feel about it? well you, it's like yeah. you're you're not doing justice to the event by describing right. it with. right describing it oh let me tell you first there was the sensation yes of like, infinite love and peace and joy and connection but even those words fail to they fail yes it's uh, so what what i i felt that before you know i've been like really quiet for a long time, and you know, and somebody might be like, are, is, there, "Is there something wrong with you?" Yes, are you okay? But yes, but okay? I don't. It's like, <laughs> it's like, what do I say? I'm just like, I'm feeling profound <laughs> love and peace <laughs> coming into me, and I don't know. Well, part of it is I don't. I didn't want to ruin it. I didn't want to like. Yes. I figured if, if I start talking about it, that's going to somehow destroy it. It's just like in tarot, you know, the the swords. When mm-hmm. people have that little prayer they say before they do a tarot reading. With the wand createth thee, 
with the uh, cup sustaineth thee, with the sword destroyeth thee, with the coin redeemeth thee. So when you look at swords or you look at air signs in uh, astrology, there's a, a way of separating, you know, with our minds. That's what it's always about. Like you're going to see contrast. You're going to separate this from that. And that's a useful thing in life. You know, you don't want to eat soup with a fork because <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> so there is this element of reality that's totally necessary. But when you're talking about spiritual, re <clears throat> spiritual reality, forks and spoons don't, don't amount to much, you know, with that part of our mind that needs to differentiate between this and that. And it's, it's really difficult to uh, talk about it and to even try attacking it with the mind um, feels like it's a dishonoring of exactly. it. Exactly. You know? Dishonoring. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to ask you like how you felt, but what were the circumstances when you had these, I mean, these experiences? Mm. Well, it, a big part of it has to do with uh, getting out of transference in human design, actually. Uh, and I was also doing shamanic healing at the time. Um, a lot of shamanic sessions with very seasoned practitioners who were helping me uh, clear my energy, helping me heal old wounds from my past and from childhood and even things that might currently be around me with energies, entities, forces, beings, all kinds of stuff like that. You could think of it as patterns. Mm -hmm. You could think of it as just psychosomatic patterns. Or you could think of them as totally separate entities. I'm not here to argue which. I'm just saying that there's something. And when you remove, when you remove these things and you start to heal on that level, boy, is it an amazing thing. But I was doing that alongside with understanding uh, transference in human design which has to do with the the substructures of the designs on earth i just made a course about it a three and a half hour course that i uh did a video about on my youtube channel and it's it, it, that, that's basically what happened i got snapped out of transference really fast uh really powerfully um suddenly and but i tell people in the video that it, it's a progressive thing and it has to do with awareness really when you're aware that's number one. Contemplation and being aware of what kind of transference you may be in with your substructures and how all that works. Uh, I, I kind of get into it a little bit uh, in, the, in the video. I've done certain other videos about it, but it is a really big deal. I don't like freaking people out about it, but it is a big deal. I think transference is a big deal. I was in very deep transference. And when I got out of it, it was like, that's when I started experiencing this, these powerful surges of energy. It's kind of like, Sort of like what happened with the Gene Keys, but different. You know, Gene mm -hmm. Keys in, in a way is kind of surface level because you're looking at the hexagram itself on the surface. But when you look at the substructures of, of the hexagram and are getting into the colors and tones, boy, that is, that is some powerful stuff because we're being in the, like shamanically speaking, being in the middle world where it's really dense um, the middle world is where we're at now. It's where all the action is. And it, there's a lot of density here. But when you look at uh, the substructure of the lines in, in human design, it's sort of like the, the density of this world, you could call it like a hom homogenized field. It's sort of like a, you know, about the morphogenetic field that Rupert Sheldrake talks about. Mm -hmm. It's almost like there's a, a pressure within it concerning humanity to conform you could call it the ego program that we've been in an ego program for a while. And the ego is really funny because it thinks it's so different when it just makes everything the same. And it, it, cre it leads to a lot of defensiveness and a lot of uncertainty and it can kill appreciation for your own, your own life, like your, really your own life. And getting out of transference puts you in alignment. That's what it does. When you understand your, your colors and your tones and your left, right fixing on that, those substructure levels, especially, with the designs on earth, it's like over time, it's, it's a bing and that's what happened to me. And uh, it just led to a lot of experiences. Uh, over so the it last. was more a confluence of circumstances and things you were into. Right, right. Yeah. And I think it's like that with people, you know, because I, I could be like, well, in order to get out of transference, you got to hire this shaman and have them do sessions on you every day for a few months. And then, you know, but, but that's not that's how it was for me. And I can't say that's how it's going to be for everyone, but that's why I focus mostly on awareness itself. When, when you're aware of what's going on and you're aware of certain addictive patterns that can take place. 
um, with with uh, the substructures. That's what that's what the course is all about. Noticing what those addictive patterns are, what's good for you and what isn't good for you, what's in alignment with you, what isn't in alignment with you, and how you might be habitually doing the thing that is out of alignment with you. You mm -hmm. know, we see a lot of that with color. You know, it can happen quite a bit depending on the person. Some people are way deep in it, like I was. Some people might not be so deep. Um, but when you come to appreciate your native cognition and how you're really functioning on that on that level, a lot of things can happen. Uh, powerful, powerful th things that can put you in alignment. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Matt. I uh, thank you for your time uh, for you're this welcome. very extensive interview where you shared um, a bit on the human design and also your personal experiences with mixing your uh, various sources of knowledge. Mm. I'm gonna link down below uh, Matt's uh, YouTube channel, his uh, website erotica.net and also the video that we reference um, circuitry and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have any upcoming projects or anything? Uh, well, right now I'm in Tenerife and we're hosting retreats for people where we're combining human design and Anthony William, the medical mediums material mm -hmm. uh, to help people come into as much alignment as they can with this transition because it's, it's no joke. We, we don't want to uh, lie to people and say everything's fine and dandy. Chronic illness is on the rise and it's going to be getting much worse in the next 20 years. So what we're trying to do is head it off and get people aware of uh, it, that it doesn't need to be as bad because the storm is coming. Uh, like it, it's here and it's going to keep get churning, you know, but we don't have to identify with it so much. There are ways of, of coming into alignment. Uh, there's things we can do to uh, lessen the suffering and, and have more compassion and, and know what's really going on with our health, with our life, with our purpose. And that's what our retreat's about. Um, and we're doing that for people right now. Uh, I'm working. I'm working on a human design video that may be mm -hmm. out in a few months. That's focusing on um, uh, creation, sexual energy, and manifestation and intention. Uh, it's it's taken me again about a year and a half put, put it, putting all of this together. So uh, it, it's quite a powerful thing, and it, I'm letting it come in its own time, like in that sacral generator way it's got God, it. i noticed that with generators and for me as a manifester it's a bit annoying like why does it take you so long <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta it's just how it is like i might I find a piece of information tomorrow <laughs> that is just the right piece of information i needed and it's like well it's a good thing i waited seven months uh because i needed this i needed this right now and then boom and it, it'll happen yes it, looking forward to to seeing that yeah uh, okay so thank you again i'll see you guys soon with more videos make sure to check out matt's uh, website and youtube channel this has been carmina see you soon bye